Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Stigler for the Details. My name is Alan Dickerson, known in some wargaming circles as Stigler. And we're going to uh, continue our tutorial series on the seminal favorite flat top. And in this episode, we're going to talk about searches. Search and detection is obviously critical to this game because when you start uh, a scenario in flat top, you only know what the scenario setup tells you as to where the enemy is. Um, after that, you have no idea where they go. So it will be incumbent upon you to send out a search aircraft and to make use of uh, other resources such as Coast Watchers to try and fill in an intelligence picture of where the enemy is going and even more important than that at times so that you can locate him to send some airstrikes his way. So it's uh, very key to a hidden movement game to have successful searches, and to locate the enemy. And this is how you do it in flat top. Okay. During the, during the turn, uh, you're following the sequence of play, and you start with, after you determine whether the clouds move or anything like that, you start with air operations. And this is where you consult, uh, say, your air operations chart here, which tells you which task forces contain which ships and which aircraft are contained on those ships, usually carriers, but sometimes you can have uh, cruisers and airplane tenders, which can also carry ships. And you uh, create sorties for aircraft on your air record sheet where you note the type of aircraft being launched, the duration of its flight, marking its kind of its midpoint and its end point, and more on the end point. Um, I guess in another episode where we get into this a little bit more. But basically, you basically set the range. And by the time a plane has um, expended its range, it's got to be back at the ship that it came from, or perhaps it could uh, divert to a land base or something that can handle it. But it's got to return safely. Otherwise, there are really, really bad penalties for uh, not recovering your planes, especially if it's if uh, their loss is caused by um, not caring if they come back. So, in other words, if uh, say a uh, plane takes off from a carrier and while it's out on patrol, um, the carrier is sunk. Well, you know that had nothing to do with the player. So the uh, the points for lost aircraft would be uh, typically two victory points per per um, aircraft factor. But if a plane is lost through uh, negligence of the player, i.e. he doesn't return it in time or before it runs out of gas, then it uh, costs... 10 victory points per factor. So anyway, I digress. So um, the player sets out its uh, sortie and then um, an aircraft, I'll make this visible for now, an aircraft uh, formation is set up on the map. And of course, it can start out to be invisible to the other player. So this is the Vassal module, and as such, we have the one map, 
and the players can actually place their forces on the map and set them as invisible so the other player can't see them until such a time as they are detected, and then you make them visible for everyone. Now, for search, um, when it is the air operations segment of the turn, and that is after um, air operations, which is the launching and setup for recovery of aircraft is done. And then the task force movement is plotted. After that, you get to the air segment. First thing you do is to roll for initiative. It's a six-sided die roll, and the high player gets initiative. If there's a tie, then the player that did not have it previously gets it. If it's a tie in the first turn, you basically just roll over. Okay, so you determine who has initiative. After that, the player that wins initiative moves their aircraft first, conducts all their searches, and prepares or sets up for combat by, say, moving their air force uh, or their air factors or air fleets that have bombers in them into hexes that contain known and spotted enemy units, and then they prepare for the combat phase, which happens after the air phase. So the player that wins initiative does all that first, conducts all their searches. Then the second player conducts all of their searches. So this gives a bit of an advantage to the player with initiative, kind of, because... Um, they have to be told of the location of any um, aircraft that or task forces that they come near or overfly before they have a chance to do anything. So um, you can you can set up for combat, uh, you know, knowing that. A task force has been plotted to move to a certain hex, and you can know with certainty where he's going to be uh, at the beginning of the combat phase, etc. Okay, so let's say for the sake of argument that here in this hex H23, we have a task force, and I'll show you which task force we have. This is Task Force 3 for the Japanese, and it consists of a light carrier, which has the vowels and cates and the zeros, um, a cruiser light, and let's say for the sake of argument that this cruiser light... Um, which is the Kinegusa, let's see, or Kimikawa. No, it says Kimigusa. Hmm, don't know why it's not listed here. Um, let's see. Not exactly sure that this is set up right because the Ryujo has a maximum capacity of 16 planes. So, yeah, this looks about right. Okay. So, let's say that it has launched a flight of Jakes, one, one point or three aircraft, three Jakes that they're going to use to search. And let's say that they suspect that the American task force must be lurking somewhere uh, off of the south of Guadalcanal. So we launch the Jakes, and we know from looking at the tables here, and let's, let's find the... Or 
Where is that? Where are all the ranges? Uh, charts, players aids, optional rules and charts, observation tables, goodness. Um, let's look at just the counters because the, in the Vassal module there the ranges and the movement factors are listed on the counters. And we find that our Jakes, see if we can find another one. There we are, have a movement factor of five and a range of nine. So they have a range to stay in the air for nine turns. And for each of those turns, they can move a maximum of five movement points. Now let's say that these Jakes are the only ships launched by the task force in this turn, so they qualify for a minimum launch, which means that they can use their full movement allowance on the turn of launch rather than half or just having to stay in the hex and form up. So this unit um, would first, according to the rules, you would first roll to see if the uh, search will be successful. So in clear weather, it is a one through four is successful. Five and six means it is unsuccessful. If the aircraft uh, starts in or at any time moves into a cloud hex, then you add one to the roll. Also, if the target is in clouds, you add one to the roll. So you roll the die. Let's say, um, well, we can only get to a clear hex. One, two, three, four, five. This is the furthest we're going to be able to get in the initial turn. So it's going to be in the clear for the whole time. So we roll and we get a five. So it's not going to be successful no matter what we do. However, we still have to make the air fleet available and you have to trace for the, for the enemy the entire route that a searching aircraft takes during that turn. So for this reason, uh, sometimes you may want to launch search planes and have them like move out a few turns out to sea and then announce that they're going to start searching so that you don't give away the location that they started from. So that's a tactical consideration. So let's say we go one, two, three, four, five, and obviously the searching player knows that the search is not going to be successful, but still. They could say if they had other search planes in the areas, try to bring in another plane to duplicate that route, who will be successful in searching, but that's that's up to the to the searching player. Now, let's assume that our die roll is a one. Boy, it took three rolls to get it. And then it would be a successful roll. Then you would move the aircraft along the searching planes. And let's say that the enemy is here. Or let's say that they're here. Okay. Let's not mark them as moved. Let's give them a heading there. Okay. As the, when you're playing face-to-face, uh, -face, as the player is moving along its route, the enemy player should be, kind of anticipating um, proximity to any of its fleets and should be thinking about when or if he will need to reveal the aircraft's um, 
for the uh, spotted task force or air fleets uh, for for the enemy. And that is according to the observation tables. And they work like this. Okay. You consult for, say, a day turn. And we'll get into night turns uh, soon, but you'll soon see that it's not even really worth it to conduct searches at night. During a day turn, you cross-reference the observing unit with the type of unit that it could observe. Then you find the uh, row that corresponds to whether it is clear or clouds that the unit uh, potential units can be spotted in. And then you cross-reference that with the row that contains the range between the observing unit and the unit being observed. And this will give you a condition. Condition one, two, or three. And that will tell you what the um, searched for player has to reveal. So as this unit is moving along, once it gets to this hex, it is within two hexes of this task force, which up until now would also be invisible. So we see that in air formation, say at high altitude in the clear, <coughs> excuse me, at a range of two would be condition one, which is the lowest condition. And in that condition, the observing player is only told that something is there. So at that point, they would be told there is something in J26. At that point, it could continue on, but probably would want to know more. And so let's say it would divert its route and get there. At a range of one, the same task force in clear weather, high altitude, is a condition two. And condition two is that the observing player is told how many air formations or task forces are present, every basic class of plane or ship present. And by class, I mean for ships, carriers are their own class. Capital ships include um, cruisers, airplane tenders, battleships, and, yeah, and cruisers of both heavy and light. And then there's a class of smaller ships, which would be destroyers, patrol groups, uh, landing crafts of all sizes, and... APDs, those are, and oilers. Also, submarines are their own class, but I'm not really going to divert into submarines right now. Then, if the aircraft decides, well, I still want to really know more, say they were told there were um, oh, also, uh, for condition two, you can inflate or deflate the number by 50%. So if this task force has uh, one carrier, um, three destroyers, and one oiler, he could, if he really wanted to, bring attention, say that there are uh, two carriers in the hex because, well, 50%, I guess you would round up. So there's one, but you could lie, but you could not reduce it by 50% and say there's half a carrier or no carrier there. So you would have to disclose that there's at least one. But for the three, say, 
destroyers that are in the hex that are categorized as small ships, 50% of that is two. So you could say it's as low as one and as high as five. So you can kind of play with his head a little bit and tell him that much. If the aircraft overflies or ends up in the same hex, then you have to give up, you know, you have to tell the full details, exactly how many task forces and exactly how many air formations are in the hex. For the air formations, you would have to say whether they are at high or low altitude, and also whether they contain unarmed, which would be interceptors or fighters, or armed, which would be bombers, aircraft in the task in the uh, air formations. For the task forces, you would have to give an accurate number of the types of um, classes of ships. So you would have to tell them the exact number of carriers, the exact number of capital ships, but you would not have to spell out specifically number of destroyers, number of battleships, number of cruisers. You would just say this number of capital ships. And for the small ships, you would say whatever number of small ships. So, um, note that your distances compromise the range that they can be spotted if the target unit is in clouds. The only effect that it has on the spotting unit is if the spotting unit moves through clouds during any point in its turn, then it affects its overall observation role, which is whether it sees anything during its search route for that turn. Okay, so that pretty much covers um, searches. After, I, hmm, let's see. Um, another thing to keep in mind is if a player is moving along its route and it flies through the same hex where the enemy has um, interceptors, then the enemy player may make a interception attempt uh, on that searching task force. Now, keep in mind that the player who is moving does not have the option to intercept any aircraft or air formations that it sees along its route. So you can't send, say, an offensive set of interceptors, set them out for search, and have them inter attempt to intercept anything they fly through. It is only if the searching player happens to enter a hex that the enemy is in, then they will be able to make an interception attempt. Um, let's see, for... Interceptions, let's see, where are those? Ah, here it is, the interception table. Interception is a function of the number of aircraft attempting to intercept and the number of air factors that are being intercepted. So if you have which is fairly common, five or less intercepting air factors, and they are attempting to intercept five or less enemy air factors, you need a five or a six for a successful interception. Then, say you have five or less, but you're trying to intercept a large formation of six or more, your odds improve to four through six, or basically 
um, if you happen to have a really large, uh, say, a cap that has six or more and you're attempting to intercept a large enemy formation, which is also of six or more, then your odds are four and six or two-thirds successful. Uh, let's see. You add one to the die roll if the air factors were involved in air-to-air -air combat last turn. So it makes it uh, harder for aircraft to, say, disengage from you um, if there had been combat the previous turn. Uh, I guess I should divert just a little bit to talk about the role of Coast Watchers, even though I don't necessarily like uh, the effectiveness of Coast Watchers um, in the game and would probably want to house rule it, but I would at least spell out the way it's handled in the game. All islands that have a blue or a red star, uh, red star being for the Japanese, blue star being for the, for the Allies, have Coast Watchers on that hex and the coast watchers can uh, initiate a search and they also must be told if the enemy uh, moves close enough to be to be uh, detected so the coast watchers let's see here on the observation tables coast watchers i believe have their own type let's see ah yes they have their own coast watcher observation table which can spot air formations that are either overflying land flying along the coast which is basically any hex that is not completely filled by land or is one from the coast so one from the coast for an air formation, they get a one. For a task force, whether in clear or clouds, they also get a one. So something is there is the reporting uh, onus for that. Now, what that means here on this map is that it is impossible to navigate the slot for either player because, say, Choi Soul here and Vela Lavella, Kalavangara, New Georgia are all within one hex of the slot itself, this C lane here. So they would have to be told that at least something is there. And presumably, if the task force is moving, both of the hexes that it moved through would be within one hex of a coastal hex of these islands, which are really comprised of all coastal hexes. And so you would have to tell uh, the enemy that something is there through that, which, of course, could draw some of their uh, search formations when it is time for them to conduct their searches. So, um, also keep in mind that during the aircraft uh, phase, detected, um, detected air formations and task forces are made visible to both players for the rest of the turn. So that presumably the other player, if they have not already conducted their uh, air movement, could move strike packages into the hex, etc., and then later conduct combat. If at the end of the combat, in the end of the turn, um, aircraft are are or task forces and um, air formations that are not in the same hex can be made invisible again. And uh, 
um, what happens at the beginning of the, let's see here, at the beginning of the task force execution phase, which is where fleets are moved and their movement is plotted, there is a shadowing segment. So if you have a air formation that uh, ended up within one hex of a task force or in the same hex as it, you can declare a shadowing attempt, which in clear weather is successful on a one through five. If you're in clouds, then it is uh, one through four. And if they make that die roll, then the um, air formation, or actually it could be a fleet that has successfully shadowed, gets to see the movement of the task forces that it is shadowing. Um, and so basically they they are not turned invisible. So that's an additional effect. Now, of course, um, you have to move your shadowing unit to keep up with the task force as it moves. And depending on how long your search plane has been, your search uh, air formation has been out there, that may complicate it getting back to its ship at the end of its uh, range allotment. So you either might have to send out another task or another air formation to kind of take over the shadowing duties, or you can break off and you know, return back to the ship. And then, of course, the task force will eventually go invisible and you're going to have to locate it again. That's all part of the cat and mouse of uh, searches and task force. So I've been Stiegler, and this is all for this segment, and we'll see you next time.